But the key piece there is what you learned in 2019, you made and adjusted from so that when the next cycle came, you were able to thrive from it instead of get hurt from it. Opportunities come at you when you least expect them. And that's really what happened here. Not only did we take this pandemic and grow, but we're setting a groundwork for future years. I think that that positioning will grow us into a $100 million brand without us even realizing what's happening and when it's happening. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Scott Pieper. I'm the CEO of Mobilization Funding. I'm really excited today to bring a guest to you, Isaac Dustar. He is the CEO of Dose. It's a beauty brand. Um, he's also a friend of mine, a client, some that we worked here before, has a super interesting story. I'm very excited to share some of the specifics with you guys. And without further ado, I want to welcome Isaac. What's going on, man? How are you, man? How's everything? I'm good. How are you? Good. Busy. We're, we're in the middle of holiday season, so you can imagine, especially the new world we're living in, a lot of the DTC business is, uh, you know, picking up, and we got to kind of just keep working with that. So uh, all e-commerce right now for the most part. I was just saying, it's all virtual, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and then, you know, the, a couple of the stuff that you guys helped us out with, those big orders, you know, they're, they're more, you know, campaigns more than anything else. So the, the feedback is coming in as well, obviously. So things are, you know, it's kind of settling down as we wrap up 2020. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of your story about 2020 and where you come from in 2019. And I know some of the bat, some of the original struggles and how you've been able to utilize some of those lessons learned. So without further uh, complication or warm ups, I think we just jump straight into it. Yeah, let's do it. My name is Isaac Dusta. I'm the CEO of Dose. Uh, we're a color cosmetic company based out of New York City. Um, our mother corporation has been around for 20 plus years, but uh, Dose as a brand has only been around since 2008. That was the early stages. Um, I think we've developed and grown significantly over the past 12 years as a brand. Um, we are a luxury brand, so you know, distribution is a little bit difficult, but at the same time, I think you know, being a luxury brand in the luxury sector makes things a lot more interesting and you know, it allows exponential growth very quickly. Um, we do business all over the world. Uh, primarily, you know, our initial start was in the Middle East, but you know, over the past five, six years, we've turned our attention to the United States, Europe, Latin America, and you know, East Asia as well as of recent. And you know, we're looking to grow and expand. And 2020 has been a rough but great year, I think, for us more than anything. And we're looking to capitalize on it. I love it. I really appreciate you joining on this. It's we have we do a lot in construction and a lot in manufacturing, but a lot of our content tends to be construction based. Right. So to have our manufacturing clients and others just hear your perspective, your approach, how you're handling, of course, telling your story, but also how you utilize the financing to help drive your volume. Of course. You what we found quickly was manufacturing clients end up in the same struggles from traditional banking or traditional volume size mm -hmm. purchase financing as our construction clients they're almost in this it's, in some ways it's the same context it's really weird so right you used it and did it perfectly and you it, you know you you're so cool cool to share your feedback with us we don't get that a lot so i really like I, what one i like and appreciate you doing that thank you of course um, but it's cool that I think other people can benefit from hearing how you do it. Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, so as a company, we never have enough, we never had enough funds to begin with. And that's the reality behind, you know, that you had the initial investment of the company, which was a couple hundred thousand dollars. But in my industry where you have many, many SKUs, all of a sudden, a couple hundred thousand dollars becomes nothing. It disappears. It disappears very quickly. And it's great in a sense where, okay, you know, your money, there's turnover on that money where, you know, you're turning it into inventory and if you can sell your inventory fast enough, you're seeing that turnover maybe four or five times a year, which is wonderful, you know, at the, at the very least in yeah. terms of, you know, then you have the profits and everything else that comes along with it. But then you have these massive orders that you can process. You're getting the orders, you're, you know, you're growing as a company, but you don't have the capital. And the reality is the bank credit line or anything you can get from the bank immediately isn't going to solve your problem because it's going to cap out. You all of a sudden need half a million dollars to make this work. And it's just sometimes not enough. And you start working with your suppliers. Uh, sometimes they're willing to work with you. There's a reality behind it. Like, okay, like, you know, we'll give you terms on this um, or give us a smaller deposit and we move forward. But then you have like, for example, we have like a new project that we're working on. And I think you guys are going to come, you know, 
very handy as kind of starts to get finalized. It's a completely new supplier. They're not going to trust me with any terms of credit for that reality is they've never worked with me. They know of me. They've been wanting to work with me and the company, but at the end of the day, they're not going to put a couple hundred thousand dollars at risk just off the top of bat, especially in this environment that we live in. And that's where you guys are coming immediately. You know, the financing is there. We give it to pay them before we ship. And, you know, it, it doesn't affect my standard cash flow throughout the year or th for that matter, for a month or two that we're dealing with this, where it makes it really easy to kind of, you know, pay this, make our money and, you know, and continuously keep doing this as we grow, because it's something that, you know, it doesn't affect my actual cash flow and it allows me to get those bigger purchase orders that I want to get, but can't afford to get. It's a good point. You bring up an excellent point because, you know, when we, when we're talking to potential clients or current clients, it's just, it's a similar story. You know, they've, they've been grinding as hard as they can. They've been marketing everywhere they have. They've been putting pieces together, grabbing this to grab that, to make this happen the whole time, marketing, marketing, marketing. And all of a sudden what you've been wanting your, your whole time in business is that customer, the new one that comes in or the existing customer that finally gives you the 15 more SKUs. And all of a sudden they do it and you're like, Oh crap, what do I do now? I just got this million dollar order. I just got this couple hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah, it was, you don't have the it's money. a million units at a time for us. I think mean, one of the things you guys helped us with that was a million and change units. That's a significant amount of, you know, pieces for a company like us. That's like Estee Lauder quantities you know, in the cosmetic industry. It's not normal. When I re reach out to a supplier, say I need a million units, they look at me like, are you sure? Yeah. And then you say yes. And then when it succeeds, and the funny thing is that some of the sales reps move to a different company and this has happened to us already. They reach out trying to get, you know, they, you know, they pitch themselves to the, that supplier of their, like, Hey, listen, we're going to come in and we're good sales reps. We, we can bring you a new client that's already doing these kind of volumes. And there isn't that many new clients in the industry that can bring volume like we are right now. And all of a sudden that becomes very important for them. So, you know, they're willing to work with us. The clients, my clients are willing to work with us on these big numbers but you know, the monetary funds need to be there for it to actually happen. And that's yeah. the reality behind it. So can you tell a story? Cause you know, you, you know, just to give a little background, you had a very successful business. It's, it's existing for plenty of period of time. You have current clients. And when you came to us, you had a really unique scenario that was really quite frankly, exactly how we just described, but instead of me characterize it in generality, maybe you could just take a couple of minutes and tell them, Hey, here's the scenario I had. I went, you went out and looked at the marketplace to try to find a way to finance it. And you ultimately found us and we were able to move through the transaction. Maybe you can just talk about what you guys did. Start. Yeah, absolutely. You know, every company has ups and downs and the reality is uh, 2019 was a rough year for us. You know, it was a lot of adjust. It was an adjustment period. And as a company that relied a lot on specific clients, those orders just didn't come in for that 2019 year. So it put us in a very tough position in terms of a cash flow. And so instead of building out that initial cash flow that we had built out, we were very running low on cash and we were spending a lot more on marketing to kind of position ourselves for 2020 and 2021. And, you know, it, obviously it's paid off right now because we have a lot of new clients coming in through the door. And then you had this pandemic happen. So you're already kind of low on cash and you're maneuvering and you got these orders and all of a sudden everything just stops for you. No more money. People aren't paying. Uh, everyone is kind of just standing in there waiting to see what's going to happen next. On that moment, your clients are kind of worried about their products because, you know, these are some of these things are actually guaranteed, which makes it a lot easier. They're more contracted versus just let me purchase the inventory and put it in here and let's see what happens to it. This is a, it's a very clean transaction where a client purchases a significant amount, gives you six months to deliver. You go ahead and produce it. And I don't even see the merchandise. It goes directly from factory to client without anyone ever touching it. And as this was happening, all of a sudden your supplier turns around and says, well, listen, we're living in a very difficult time period where we're not going to let you ship these products without giving us at least some sort of deposit. When this is not, this was a supplier that would give us 60 days credit, which is perfectly fine for us. It took us that amount of time to turn around the money. We would give the money, but all of a sudden you're playing with new rules and, you know, new game completely. And that's where, you know, I reached out to somebody who ended up introducing us. And it was like, like, this guy's perfect for you guys. And that's where Scott and I met. And, you know, you guys plugged right in. And we did this for, I think, two or three different ones already. And it just gave us a lot more, you know, leeway. And honestly, it gave me so much more calm and relaxation that I was able to start focusing on the business and growing the business differently. Because now I know, hey, I got mobilization funding behind me. I know I can go ahead and get these purchase orders. I know I can, you know, reach out and really get those big orders where, 
my profit margins are significantly more, but I wasn't able to do that before because I had to pay out the money ahead in advance and which we didn't have. So, it, you know, it's just a very direct transaction and you guys just kind of came in and plugged right in where you plug that hole of where that monetary funds was going to be at the time. And as soon as that hole gets plugged in, that entire you know, cycle starts flowing significantly better, significantly easier, and I think more calm across the board. You know, I'm changing gears on you a little bit. I'm curious just to hear, and I think what everyone would really benefit from is just hear a little bit about your, your story, your thoughts on business. I mean, you pivoted tremendously through COVID. I mean, you guys have operations in New York City, you have operations in Long Island, you have people, you're ordering suppliers internationally, you're selling online all across the U.S. and other places, even outside the U.S. I mean, look, coronavirus has touched everybody. I mean, people might have been open, but their suppliers were closed. That's a problem. Mm, right. <laughs> you know, people's suppliers <laughs> are open, but their customers are closed. I mean, there's all different issues, and you've navigated through just about every one of them. Talk about that a little bit. Let's let's see what wisdom you can pass on to everyone and kind of I can't take a lot of credit for it. I think, you know, sometimes your product your circumstances. I think that's the first step. Um being that 2019 was such a rough year for us, I think we had already scaled down and kind of from a monetary standpoint tightened our budgets where, you know, if we needed to let someone go, unfortunately, we already had done that. And we were already down to a core skeleton crew to make sure the company functions and operates until we could, you know get a lot more cash back into play and really build from there. And that was always the plan for 2020. So initially I think we were able to absorb the shock a lot better than most brands or companies to begin with, because we were already in that position of, okay, we're already there. We don't have to do what other companies are going to have to end up forcing to do. But at the same time, I think working with very strong suppliers across the industry where, you know, even during a shutdown, they were considered as essential, even though they don't produce essential products, but they were the manufacturing arm of, you know, for example, we produce 60% in Germany. Germany is back on lockdown again, to an extent, and our factories are functioning perfectly fine. You know, there are a lot of automated factories, so they need minimal staff to function as is. Um, in addition to that, they're just major corporations that, you know, they weren't, you know, the governments weren't letting them shut down regardless. They're the backbone of the industry. And I think that that in a way we lucked out with when choosing well, luck that is in these are our suppliers, but I think choosing the right suppliers to work with from day one, instead of trying to cut corners and dealing with the big boys and, you know, people who produce not just for us, but they produce for the bigger brands in the industry. It gave us a sense of security and, you know, kind of stability during this time period, as much as yes, we had issues, you know, in terms of credits, all of a sudden our, you know, our credits were cut in half and we were not, we were not being extended credit they were producing and they were moving very quickly through production. Uh, in addition to that, having really good relationships with their clients and always being, you know, very candid myself personally, I like to be very transparent with my clients off the top of my head. And especially if they're larger clients, I don't necessarily hand them off to sales reps within the company. They know who I am. They deal with me directly in person at times and they felt comfortable. I think we give them a sense of security, understanding if they reach out to us, and we say we can deliver a specific product, they're in, you know, in really good shape. And I think that's what really paid off where, you know, they came to us. We had actually, one of the things we worked together was, it wasn't even planned. It was the company they had orders coming in, suppliers couldn't deliver the products to those specific brands who were supposed to deliver to one of our clients. So instead they ended up reaching out to us directly and asking us, Hey, can you deliver 200,000 units? And just luck of the draw, we're like, yes, we can. And, you know, they, they come to you and all of a sudden it gives you a nice little boost. So I think one of the clients that that actually happened to was, uh, you know, it revived our business with them. We had another business with them for a couple of years and it, it revived the business. And, you know, we're looking for a big, big 2021 20, with them and it, it shifted dramatically for us. And it was really great to see, you know, they had that trust and confidence. And I think it's part of it is always being very forthright and upfront with your people and letting them know what's happening even no matter how bad it is, it's best to be direct and, you know, paint them the picture. So when reality is when things do hit the fan, they know you're going to be very candid and direct with them and they can at least trust you during times of uncertainty and, you know, people just not being very communicative in regards to what's actually happening. You know, 
listening to you talk about this is a couple key takeaways that I think are important for that I want to really accent and point out. But what you said a few times that I heard is performance is the key, like performing, performing on your word, performing what you said you're going to do, taking orders and fulfilling the ones you know you can. And if you can't, telling them and setting proper expectations of what you can do, when you can do it and why you can't just in a very transparent manner. I'd bet that even in some of those scenarios, that didn't only help you keep the business you have, but it probably earned you additional business. Yeah. And it probably made sure customers knew that, you know, they can somebody you or somebody that can count on. So you turn what normally are negatives into into positives. Yeah. The other thing you said that I thought was really key that you learned from 2019, which I think is great foresight because I have a saying in our office that I actually heard a, a mentor of mine say that, you know, things happen for you, not to you, you know, and in the moment in 2019, you probably felt like a lot of stuff was happening to you. Oh yeah. But <laughs> it was probably nothing compared to what we, we lost a lot of sleep in 2019. <laughs> and you know, that all 2019 did was ultimately prepare you for what was about to happen in 2020, which right. you know, I don't know all the intricacies of that, but 2020 is probably maybe even arguably could have been a lot worse than 2019 if you had the same infrastructure and you were doing things. Oh, we would have been, yeah, I, you and I would not be speaking today if that was the case. And that's the reality behind it. Even, yeah. um, you know, we have a credit line with JP Morgan Chase and per that they have to reach out to us quarterly and ask us for some paperwork and Hey, like, you know, how's business going? And, you know, he called me, my business banker gave me a call of like, this is about a month and a half ago. And he just goes, uh, yeah, listen, I know we asked for quarterlies and stuff like that, but I think we're just not going to do it for 2020 at, at this point and probably half of 2021 because, you know, no one's business has, uh, you know, grown and, you know, have problems. I'm like, well, I'm like, you could take a look at mine. We're triple what we were in 2019 right now. So if you, if you want to give me extra credit by all means, and he was like laughing, he's like, I don't think they're going to give you anything, but that's unreal to hear. And he was like, you know, it, it, it put us a little bit more at ease to hear, Hey, great. Okay. You know what? People are doing bad makes sense obviously makes sense business is down across the board for so many people but not only do we take this pandemic and grow but you know we're setting a groundwork for future years from a year that not, was not supposed to be great for a lot of people mm -hmm. and you know as we were sitting down and talking to the couple of the partners it was it was like you know i'm like it could be so much worse for us and just like we're on cruise control in addition to just like you know the standard core of the business was on cruise control mm -hmm. but we all of a sudden had this growth spurt that we weren't even expecting. We were growing. We, we, we knew we were going to double. We knew that was going to be the case because the reality is 28. We, we knew we would get back to what 2018 levels were and 2017 levels were instead of 2019, but we weren't expecting to, you know, profoundly grow yeah. within that time period, especially during this pandemic. You know, for the, for the people that are listening to this, what I want people to take away from that and what I certainly am going to is what you learned in 2019 allowed you to make the adjustments to pivot to put yourself in a in a place where you could have an opportunity to succeed the next time and you know life works in cycles and business is the same way for what what happened to you isaac in 2019 is what a lot of people are going through right now in 2020 if not worse if not worse and so if you can survive and thrive and really make the adjustments um during this really hard time and by the way mobilization funding has had its own struggles during this time too we've done we've been in the same boat we've made adjustments we've worked with our customers we're working with our bank we're we're in a great spot but it, it took a lot of work and effort to make these adjustments through the last six seven months and what we decided to do is a lot of what you decided that we made the adjustments we got to where we needed to be we tried to help as many of our customers as we can initially really putting out all this type of different content and marketing we did while we were, were slow and now we're keeping it up. But it, what the key piece there is what you learned in 2019, you made and adjusted from so that when the next cycle came, you were able to thrive from it instead of get hurt from it. And I right. want folks listening to this to take this opportunity, what's happening in 2020, if it is hurting you, make those adjustments because we're going to quickly be in another cycle and that cycle will give you the opportunity to thrive from the problem that you're having now. Yeah, you adjust and, you know, I think if you give up that easily, you know, you just have to, you know, it, 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 you have to take risks. This is the reality behind it. I don't think everything, nothing is going to be risk free. I think, you know, 2019 was a wake up call for us, but, you know, we took those necessary risks going to 2020. We dragged our feet a little bit. We, you know, we made those adjustments, but at the same time, 
opened ourselves to the additional risk going into 2020, but, you know, we had to capitalize on it. That was the reality behind it. And I think, you know, pandemic right now, we would have capitalized on it and, you know, we, we were going to move forward regardless of the matter. But just as things have played out, it's just expanded our business significantly. And I think, you know, uh, opportunities come at you when you least expect them. And that's really what happened here. And, uh, you know, this morning, I can't say much about it, but I had a very interesting conference call and it came out of nowhere. And I think it's going to be, it, it, as I was describing it to someone else, it's the biggest fish in the sea you can fry. And you can really, you can really capture. And that's happening for us in the European Union. And, you know, it, little by little, I think that that positioning that will give us, will grow us into a hundred million dollar brand without us even realizing what's happening and when it's happening. And, you know, if we, you and I are having this conversation two, three years from now, I, we might be a completely different company because of it. But, you know, I think it's the opportunity. Uh, a lot of brands got kind of washed out in my industry during this time period. And a lot of brands who did survive, um, for example, like these are public numbers, like a uh, Shiseido group of companies, they were down 30% in a span of like two quarters. That's significant, you know, Estee Lauder and L'Oreal, not so much because they have mass brands and, you know, they adjusted better, I guess, if you want to call it, but you see where, you know, they focus specifically on luxury and, you know, dealing with specialties, perfumery such as Sephora and Ulta and department stores where, you know, their retail business had come to a complete halt. Uh, they suffered greatly, but, you know, brands like myself who, you know, adjusted and already knew the market where it's going towards, we were already on the econ business. That was our main focus. And it allowed us to maneuver. And because of it, where, you know, we're able to bring new products in towards the end of this year versus someone like from the Shiseido group where now they're just trying to sell stock where they don't even have a proper holiday campaign because they have so much left over from the past six months in terms of stock. And, you know, people are fed up and they're like, you know, well, listen, like their, their clients are like, well, we can't sell your old stuff because we need new stuff. They're in a position where they can't just create new stuff because they have all this old stock that needs to be, you know, they have monetary issues with. So it opens the doors for us where, you know, brands like us who are, you know, big enough to survive the situation, but not big enough to fail, I guess, if you want to call it, we're able to kind of, you know, survive and thrive and now start capitalizing on those, you know, the shortcomings of the bigger brands and the shortcomings of being too small to, you know, really get through this. Speaking of brands and philosophies, you have an interesting one. I mean, you, you, your brand philosophy says, you know, discover your own individuality. And I think you talk about that both inter inside your organization and outside your organization. Talk a little bit about how you came up with that as your branding slogan, how you utilize it internally and externally and kind of what it might have done, what it's done for you. Uh, so this is just me being frank. I think it took a long time for us to get there. I don't think that was something that was, you know, the company was started with this slogan and that was kind of it. That philosophy took years and years and years to really, you know, get there. Um, I think when the partners first started the company before I was really deeply involved at the time, um, they had an idea. They had an idea for a brand. They had an idea for a look of a brand, but there was no real story to the brand, unfortunately. They, were, they, they came from a beauty industry and a fashion industry, merged heads and created this thing, which again, looked great. But there was no story behind it when, you know, when I first started, you know, dealing with it and you're like, what's the story? I'm like, there is no story. Reality is this is a brand. It's a high performance and it looks great. Buy it. That was kind of really it. And it took us a long time to really start developing that philosophy and concept behind it where I'm like, okay, so what makes us different? Why are we different? And kind of playing on that different tone. I'm like, I'm like, you know what? The world is changing. We're in a reality. And, you know, I think everyone, you know, beauty specific, there's no real term of beauty anymore. Yes, you could say this person looks great, but getting there is 400 different routes people are taking. You know, the, the same concept, you, you, everything had started to evolve. There was no more, you know, one uniform concept of this is what you have to do. And I think as society was changing, we kind of played right into it. And as we started developing these products, I'm like, well, okay, this is a multi-use product, for example. That was like, you know, one major step was like, this is great. And then we had this thing created called the Freematic system, where essentially uh, it gave you the tools to create a makeup palette, however you chose to make it. 
and it was like someone did the math in the office. It's kind of just like a joke. It's like 1.7 septillion different ways of creating a palette. So you really like, okay, if you make this, it's super, super unique to you. And the truth is, I swear, if you see some of these orders that come in on our website, I look at these things, I'm like, just for my own understanding of marketing, and I'm like, whoa, I know not in a million years, if I did this, I would have even thought about doing something like this. And I created the system. So I think that was the basis of it in terms of, you know, creating something that allows people to really express their individualism and discovering who they are versus instead of being told who they are. And I think that played a key role in terms of, you know, developing the brand, but in addition to just kind of our company culture and hiring, instead of, you know, being very uniform as a company in which I've, I've, been, I've been a very structured person my entire life. And I think this was harder for me to understand than even other people as we were hiring. I'm like, I need so much diversity in my office all of a sudden. And, you know, things started to change drastically. Uh, we were very female oriented. Uh, for a very long time because it's a beauty brand. So obviously, but then, then, you know, then we had a mix of guys come in. Then we had different ethnicities and backgrounds and races being thrown in there. We had, you know, we had all sorts of people in this office and we still do. So, and then comes 2020 where all of a sudden, you know, we had this uproar of, you know, inclusion and, you know, talking about things and, you know, the social mechanisms of how this country is working. And we started having people reach out to us and beauty brands were hit really hard where, you know, they were reaching out during the whole Black Lives Movement initially at first, and people were literally messaging us, not just us, every brand was getting messages and we're being forced to reveal, okay, what does your board look like? How many people in management are people of color and whatever? And I was literally, I'm like, well, they could look at whatever they want because we are like the United Nations in this office. And it was such an interesting thing for me to look at. And it was, we literally have people of all sorts of backgrounds shapes, colors, whatever you want to call it. Reality is we have everything. And it was, I'm like, look, we are there. We're so diverse already that I don't think people realize that. And it, it was nice. It was very refreshing. You know, we didn't get hit. Like nobody had anything bad to say about us. So I think we played into that before things have already gotten where they are today. And I think it, it, it plays into our company culture and our products. So, you know, it, it kind of everything has come full circle at this point. I appreciate you going through that because it, it is interesting and it's important. And I think a lot of companies, particularly in some of our other segments of business are really focused on um, inclusion, diversity, just differences of thought even, let alone the presentation and people of them. And it, it's important not only to what's going on today in society, but also the customer base is changing and that whether no matter what business you're in appealing to more people in your in your focus is is really key so i think it's cool that you guys came up with that brand and kind of grew into it is a cool story and how you did that yeah uh, people don't believe it but th th this there's a truth behind it. it you know it just kind of happened on its own we just let it play out and more so than forcing the issue like you know we're working on some new things uh, new brands specifically and they have their own ethos and brand stories of their own but, you know, I think they were done right from day one where, you know, we started to kind of pitch them to clients little by little without people really getting the heads up of what's happening yet. And they have their, they have their own stories, the product sells stories and, you know, whether it's from the packaging to the name of the products to the name of the actual brands. And, you know, we'll get into it later on, but essentially they have their own concepts and they're, I don't know if they're strong enough as Dosez is because reality is Dosez, it, it developed because of what was happening versus you trying to make a story and telling that story. This yeah. is, I think it just kind of, as time has gone on, we've become the story. The brand has fallen into the reality of life and social mechanisms that are kind of controlling society in today's world, which aren't going to change. I think this is the new norm and it's a good norm. It's not a, you know, I think this is something that everyone has to start, you know, really taking a look at. Um, not just in the United States, from on a global scale. And world globalism is real. Uh, five years ago, uh, I think travel was nowhere what it is today. But now all of a sudden, before the pandemic, we had people visiting countries that they never thought they would ever go to. And as the world is mixing and, you know, people are like, I know people who are working in different countries just because they want to work in a different country. They want to test different, see what the world has to offer. Are they going to ever come back to New York? Probably. I think they will at some point. But, you know, that exchange of culture is significant. 
And as the world is opening up, as, you know, I think more countries are more keen to, you know, exchange culture and, you know, go about life as is, this is just going to become more and more important of being accepting and, you know, discovering who you are as an individual, passing it forward, in addition to being accepting of what other people's individual zone looks like as well. What's one thing that you wish, um, well, two questions I have for you before we <clears throat> close out. One is, What's the one thing you wish you knew at the beginning of your career that you've kind of learned along the way that you would want to share with our audience? This is a quote, and I think I was young and stupid. And, you know, life is a journey and not a destination. And I was so quick to try to get somewhere instead of kind of working through it. And I think, you know, I guess I made a lot of judgment calls I shouldn't have early on, but I think you learn from it. And uh, that's the reality. I think, you know, try to enjoy it more than anything else, but, you know, live it out, ride it out there, you know, from rags to riches is a great story, but at the end of the day, it takes time to get there. And, you know, patience is a virtue and it's, I think, key in terms of when it comes to growing a business and, you know, going forward in life. I have a saying that I believe in that says, you know, you just can't remove time from the equation. Nope. And, it's, it's a thing. <laughs> you know, I don't think any of us are where we want to be, there's certainly, there's probably certainly thresholds that you can cross over where you feel like you're there and you made it to a degree. It, it's okay. Elon Musk still has problems. Every day he wakes up, he's not where he wants and he's done so many things that, you know, people can't even imagine. So reality is, you know, you're, you're never really there. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you do. Just enjoy it. Exactly. I yeah. couldn't agree anymore. Um, I really appreciate you going through the time with us today on these, of course. On this topic. I think it's very helpful. I love you sharing the, just your appreciation and thought process. I've always been really admired since the first time we met, not only with your business and what you have, but I could just tell the way you handle yourself, your style. Um, you know, I was at first drawn to it, but I've really grown to I really, appreciate that. really who you are. And um, I, I appreciate having you like being part of this. And honestly, and I, I've said this to you in private before, but I, I admire the company culture you guys are building. Um, I reached out to you in private about that. And I thought it was very cool and very unique. And honestly, from a financial firm, I wasn't expecting that more than anything else. I've dealt with many different financial firms. And reality is it, you guys operate like a brand, how we would operate, how I would essentially reach out to a client I'm trying to, you know, acquire where we would kind of give them this ridiculous packaging and, you know, everything else that comes along with it. And you guys really, you know, stand out in the crowd and that they're, you know, and I, the working with you guys has been such a breeze and, you know, and you guys just totally understand who we are and what our needs are. And, you know, you've made it very seamless. You know, if we need to do it, you understand this needs to be done and, you know, we can rely on, you know, expect that from you guys. You see me smiling because it, it's really what we try to do um, for you to articulate it that way and be so close or dead on to what we try to do is, um, you know, it's very rewarding. It's actually humbling to hear you say that. We don't get to hear that. <clears throat> we don't get to know enough. Like we hope that's where people. Believe me, I, I actually do wear my mobilization funding T-shirt. I actually <laughs> do wear it. And there was another one. Uh, we had a couple in the office, and one of the partners came into my office. And he's like, "What is this?" I'm like, "Oh, it's one of our, you know, financiers." He's like, "Can I have it?" I'm like, "Yep." Yeah. And he like he wore it. And comes back. I got a couple of compliments on it. <laughs> he literally took off his shirt and put it on, and like went outside and came back as midsummer. And he's like. I got a couple of compliments on this shirt. I'm like, well, it's yours now. <laughs> so I, I appreciate you saying that. I, I, I love it. I'm glad that you, uh, you did. And I just appreciate you sharing your story, Isaac. I do. I'm glad that you were willing to do this. I just wanted people to hear it and know that there's, there's definitely cool pathways out there. They're not all easy. What, what looks great comes with a lot of hard work and perseverance and failure, which you've already articulated and talked about. Everyone, if you thought this was great, um, please share it. I hope it served everybody well. Thank you guys for all joining us. And remember, if there's anything we can do for you, or if you'd like to reach out to Isaac, you can contact him here. Check out his, his beauty brands and everything else. And uh, again, thank you very much and have a great rest of your day. Of course, thank you guys so much. Appreciate it.